How to build a Blackgate Sweet P5 inch gauge locomotive part 18. The slide valves are not a good fit in the steam chest. This problem needs rectifying before I can proceed any further. There is, I think, more than one reason why the valves will not travel the full length of the port face. Last week I travelled from East Yorkshire to West Yorkshire to see some members of my family. And as Blackgate's engineering is in West Yorkshire, it seemed like a good idea to go there and buy some bits and pieces. Starting with a pair of 1-inch outside diameter die stocks. They are not expensive and very useful. I preload my dies into these and it's quicker than setting them up every time. It's a lot cheaper and more practical to do it this way than to buy a tailstock die holder for every die that I have. While I was at Blackgate's Engineering I also needed some other parts, like a selection of different sizes of brass hexagon. These are the popular sizes that I would normally use that I'd run out of. A few years ago my friend Chris English gave me some chucking pieces of a size that are perfect for quarter by forty. I still have a good stock of that size so I didn't need to buy any more. I also bought a pack of light gauge stainless steel springs because I need to make a special low pressure safety valve for the Burnack Vulcan rebuild. I bought the piece of steel because it was in a box of second hand parts. I bought this length of square section brass for another project that I'm currently on with, the steam engine boiler test plant, and from this piece of brass I will make a steam turret. I also bought this, it's a very essential part required for the sweet pea. It will need machining, but it will end up being the regulator block which is bolted to the boiler backhead. It's a piece of gun metal. I'll show the making of the regulator in detail in a future episode. That is, if I can fix the boiler. In this episode, I'm having a look at the slide valve assemblies in both of the steam chests. To look at them in detail, they need to be dismantled, and here I'm doing just that. I fitted the valve rod into the chuck of my Myford ML7R lathe, because I really didn't want to use grips on it, but I needed to hold it still so I could unscrew these parts. Here's the valve rod, and it wasn't exactly straight. I'm not going to show how I straightened the rod, but it did involve a soft hammer. The end of the valve rod that goes into a hole inside the steam chest to keep everything straight had not been machined long enough and the thread was fouling the wall of the steam chest on the inside. I machined the end of the valve rod an eighth of an inch longer and I think this should be okay, I'll find out later on in the episode. Someone's been following instructions because this valve rod is technically correct. It has a slight flat filed on one side of it this is to allow it to go in and out of the guide hole without being like a piston. I'm going to remake the drive block because it's made of the wrong material, which is steel, and over time the parts will go rusty and then they will cause problems by locking the valve in position. Not always, but frequently. As I don't want this to happen, I'm going to copy these drive blocks and remake them in gunmetal, which is a very simple milling and drilling operation. I find that the construction of this mechanism is not good. If you're building one of these locomotives, you really need to buy this book. It does make the job a whole lot easier, particularly for beginners. I would just like to say that in the book, the slide valve driving mechanism is constructed in exactly the same way as you see it in this episode. But I'm going to modify this arrangement. When I make the new drive blocks from gunmetal, I'm going to thread them down the middle so the valve spindle will screw directly into the block. This will make valve adjustment a lot easier and it's really the industry standard for miniature locomotives. All you have to do is rotate the valve spindle which will cause the drive block to move forwards or backwards on the valve spindle itself. This method is very poor and in my opinion just too fussy and wrong. I will usually set valve timing with the steam chest cover removed to make sure that the valve is travelling equidistantly over the ports. But often, after doing this, I need to make minute adjustments and all I do is remove the valve linkage 
rotate the valve spindle and that will move the position of the slide valve relative to where the valve spindle is. I'll be showing this in great detail later on in the series. This way is totally impractical and as the thread isn't concentric on the valve spindle, I'll probably make a couple of these too, if a job's worth doing, etc, etc. By modifying the valve spindle as I've just shown, the slide valve can move over the ports at each end. Although at one end, it still seems to be wrong. And also the shape of the valve is not so good, it's just chopped off on the corners. The corners of the valve need to be rounded, to match the shape of the steam chest, I may even modify this. But to start with, I'm shortening the valve spindle. Only by a small amount, just to see if it makes a difference. This method is no good at all, it's really labour intensive just to remove the valve spindle. At this stage, the original slide valves do need some lapping. They've been clumsily machined, and as you can see in this image, there are some marks on the surface that slides over the port. Once I put the valve back in place and refitted the nuts to the valve spindle, it was better, but still not good. A lot of the jobs I do are not scientific, and I'm not a good engineer, I do it by feel, and this does not feel right. Looking at this image and listening to how the valve hits the steam chest on the inside, it's clearly not right. How far back I have to go, do I have to make new valves, I don't know, but I'll do it one step at a time. There are some bolts in the end of the extension piece of the steam chest, and I thought at first it may be that the bolt was too long and fouling the valve spindle, but no, when I put the bolt back in, everything was the same. At this moment in time, I really am thinking about not fitting these plates because I don't think they're required. And besides which, even when the locomotive is finished, it's a very simple job to remove the steam chest covers and the steam chests and fit these plates between the steam chests and the cylinders. That is, after I machine the ports to a good standard in the steel plates. I'm sure this job is going to throw me a few more surprises. I always did like fault finding and repair. That's it for this episode. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.